week, you may remember if you um, were present last week, we, we opened up this sermon series called um, Basically Do Whatever He Says. That's the, that's the overall name of the series. And, and last week we kind of on, um, uncapped it, so to speak. And it, we talked about where uh, uh, Jesus in his first miracle um, with the turning of the water into wine at the w wedding in Cana. And it was so interesting because Mary, his mother, he told the servants, do whatever he says. And, and when the servants did whatever he said, a miracle happened. And, and what we talked about last week is that when there is obedience, when God, when we do what Jesus says and in obedience, miracles happen. Uh, in, in when we do that, God's glory is manifested. When we do that, people believe. And 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 when you look at, at John, and, and we're not going to bring it up tonight, but you can maybe look at it in your own time after the service. In John chapter uh, two, one through one through twelve, it's very interesting. At the last verse, there it it, it actually says even the apostles, the apostles, the disciples believed. And so in in all of that we see that belief comes through obedience, and obedience fosters belief. It fosters miracles. It fosters the manifestation of God's glory. We also noticed last week that there were some things that weren't there. That I just, I love to point them back out just because it's my, you know, it's my sermon, so I'm going to point them out to you because I think it's important. I noticed that there was no argument from the sermon from the the servants. They didn't say, "Well, you know, I'm not going to do that. It's my time off. I got a cigarette break right now." Right? They they did. <laughs> I went to Madeline, didn't I? Um, you notice that they didn't they didn't go try to do it their way. Like, no, we're just going to do this box or that box, or you know, or, or, or we're going to do this jar, but not all of the jars, because you know Jesus, you know, he hasn't started his ministry yet, so he can only maybe do eighty gallons of water instead of one hundred and eighty gallons. They didn't do it their way; they did it Jesus's way. You notice that they didn't go to one of his disciples and say, "Hey, are we really supposed to do this, or is this just one of his parables?" Is, are we supposed to do it some other way? They didn't do that. And so we talked a little bit more last week about that Jesus is telling us to, to follow. He's telling us to, to make disciples. He's telling us to forgive. And tonight, as we, we look at this, um, you know, a lot of times, one of the things that, that we struggle with, I think, and well, what I struggle with, and why we're not obedient is oftentimes we have a belief issue. And we have a belief issue because we know who we are. We know where we've come from. We know our family of origin, so to speak, right? When I look at my family of origin, my family of origin um, was a mess, number one. But number two was, was, was heathens at best. Seriously. Um, there wasn't anybody in my family that had worshipped the Lord. Uh, you know, in, in um, let's just say, well, I was growing up. Now, of course, I have family members now that have given their lives to Christ, praise Jesus every day for that. But as I was growing up, Jesus wasn't spoken about. The first time that I graced the church's door was to get my baseball ba baseball after breaking its window. That's the, only, the first and only time that I'd actually graced a, a church's door until I was probably 15 years old when I went to my sister's wedding. It's crazy. And so I know my, I, I know my family of origin, you know. Um, tonight, we're going to start in kind of a different place tonight. And, and I want to answer that question right off the bat because... You know, Jesus is telling you to do whatever he says, and oftentimes you're saying to him back, but you don't really know me. And and he does. He knows everything about you. 
we're going to start in the old school. We're going to go all the way back to Second Chronicles. It's an interesting story. I just want to try to try to touch on it just to to kind of um, kick this um, sermon off tonight. In Chronicles, Second Chronicles, excuse me, twenty nine. Second Chronicles twenty nine talks about Hezekiah. Now, not the book of Hezekiah, Paul, but the Hezekiah. And so, so the um, what we have to understand about Hezekiah was that Hezekiah was the son of Ahaz, and he was a nasty individual. He um, he did basically everything he did was against the Lord. He he. He worshipped idols. He worshipped Baal, right? Um, and he, it says here that he did not do what was right in the eyes of the Lord. Um, basically did the opposite. Even so much so, and, and, and a lot of people, I, I'm not a lot of people, but people that, that don't spend a lot of time in the Bible don't realize this, but the Israelites even were sacrificing babies. They were doing that under um king is now we don't get have to get too judgmental about that because america is sacrificing every day you know and so we not to, you know don't let's not put ourselves above anybody but we see that going on uh every day in america hezekiah began to reign when he was 25 years old so he was a, he was a young man when he began to reign but he was total opposite of what his father was. He wanted to do what was right in the sight of the Lord. He was the one that opened the temple back up and basically opened the doors back up and cleaned all the garbage out of the temple and, 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 and uh, decreed that it would be clean. And, and then he charged the priests. And I'm bringing this forward to you tonight in, in, in such a way that, you know, this is in, in many people will look at this verse and they'll say, well, that's Old Testament. The, the Levites, right? They were the priests of the time. And I, and I get that. I get it. This is Old Testament. But here's the thing. Hezekiah is charging or, or um, encouraging or challenging the priests to step up and to honor God with their, with, with their service in the temple. And, and, and I'm doing that the same to you tonight, because in the New Testament, we are all priests. If you've given your life to Christ, if you've given your life to Christ, you're a priest of your own home. If you've given your life to Christ, you are a priest. And so I just draw your attention to verse 10 here of Second Chronicles 29. It says, now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord, the God of Israel in order that his fierce anger may turn away from us. So Hezekiah is making a covenant, not only for himself, but he's making a covenant for Israel, the his people, okay? Now, this covenant, this covenant is similar to the covenant that we have already have established with Jesus Christ, if, again, we are in Christ. We have a covenant with God that, that Jesus' blood covers. That, that in Christ Jesus, we are now justified. We are now okay with God. We don't have to experience the wrath of God. People say, well, this is, you know, this is after the cross. There is no wrath of God. If you're not in Christ, you're going to experience the wrath of God. Many times, it's, it's, many times that wrath of God is, is really just the consequences of our own decisions. But there's a wrath of God that's going to come. And, and primarily at the, end, at the end times. And so look what it says here in verse 11. It says that my sons do not now be neg negligent for the Lord has chosen you to stand in his presence. I'm not sure you fully understand your position in Christ Jesus. Because Christ Jesus has chosen you to stand in his presence. He's chosen you to stand in his presence. But to do what? To stand in his presence, to do what? To minister to him. You know, we have a calling to minister to God. We have a calling to minister, minister to God and to do his ministry. 
right, to be his ministers and to make offerings to him. And so I, I open this up just kind of getting your mind going where we need to go because the title of the sermon uh, tonight is, is similar to last week's, but just a, a, a couple things added here. Do whatever he tells you first. Do whatever he tells you first. You know, so many times we hear the Lord say, hey, I want you to go do this or I want you to go do that. And we are, we are similar to some of the stories that we've heard in the Bible. Well, I got to go bury my father. I got to go say goodbye to my family. I got to go do this. I got to go do that. Jesus is telling us if we're in intimate relationship with Jesus, we should be getting directions on a, quite frankly, on a moment by moment and daily basis. We should be getting our directions. And but here's the thing: many people think, well, you know, well, I got to go do this. You only got to go do that as if the Lord's directed you to do that. Well, and you know, we can start with a string of excuses, right? Of why we can't do what God has told us to do. In um, at the end of that verse, there in verse eleven, it, it's talking about making an offering to God. Well, of course, in the, the sacrificial system uh, as we know it is is no more. We don't have to take. Thank God, we don't have to. You know, I've got. Um, Roughly 400 uh, animals uh, on Faith Farm, um, 128 of them are calves. Thank God we don't know how to go out there and start picking calves and, and having to take them every week or every day or whatever it was to sacrifice them, right? I mean, that's just, we don't have to do that anymore. But there's a different kind of sacrifice, isn't there? It's called a living sacrifice. We're supposed to be bringing offerings to the Lord. Those offerings are a living sacrifice. It's us. We're supposed to be giving us to the Lord. We're supposed to be giving ourselves to the Lord. We're supposed to be doing it first. You know, when, um, when the Pharisees, when they came to Jesus in Matthew chapter, I think it's 22. Yeah, Matthew 22, uh, 37. They're going to bring it up on the, on the um, screen here. Matthew 22, 37. And it says here, um, he's talking about what is the, what the Pharisees are asking him, what is the greatest commandment, right? And he's saying to, 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 you shall love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, right? Everybody knows that, right? If you've spent any time in the Bible at all, that's the commandment, right? That's the number one thing that we're supposed to love God with, with all of our being. And Jesus tells us all, or tells the people in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, he's telling them to go seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, right? So seek first in Matthew 6, 33, it says uh, to seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. It's interesting. Why don't we do that? Why don't we seek first the kingdom of God? I believe it's because we don't believe. I believe it's because we don't think we have to. I think that there, we have got options. That's what I believe. I believe, I believe we think we have options. That, that we have, you know, that... We have an option. Well, we can or we can't, right? In 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 Revelations, uh, you know, and and I'm getting to, I'm bringing these up to get to an actual point here. So bear with me here. In Revelations chapter two, he's talking. He's talking to the um, the church. Of course, I didn't mark that mark that one. He's talking to the church. He says, I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. Man, sounds pretty good so far, doesn't it? And how you cannot bear with those who are evil. Wow, man, this is pretty good. 
but have tested those who call themselves prophets and are not, and found them to be false. I know you are enduring patiently and bearing up for my name's sake, and you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Many of us, when we first come to Christ, God has done something so big in our lives that we've actually recognized him. We have, we, some of us have had some very emotional moments when we've come to Christ and, and, and at, at salvation. And, and we can see those days. We can, it's stamped on our, on our mind the day that we came to Christ and, and what he did for us. And, and for whatever reason, maybe life or, or just circumstances, but that first love begins to go away. That, that feeling that we had at salvation when we had that moment with the Lord, a sense of the peace and, and the presence of God that come over us at salvation. We've got to choose to put him first. We have to choose to, to seek first the kingdom of God. We have to choose to put him first in everything. In every decision, we have to choose to put him first. In everything, we have to put him first. And here's the thing that 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 really, um, as I was working through this myself, and these are some of the things that God has has been been speaking to me about. And I'm just allowing you to listen in. And it really, honestly, He's been speaking to me about this. And I was praying and asking Him, "Okay, Lord, so I, I want to do this. I want to put You first in everything." And many people will say, well, Rick, you're a pastor. You should, you should be putting him first. If anybody should be, you should be. And listen, th there's a lot of things that, that I, I profess that I do, do put God first in. But listen, I confess to you it's here and now that there are some things that I don't put God first in. But I, wanna, I, I want to. And so as I was praying and asking the Lord, um, how do I do this? H how do I begin? To put you first in everything, in every decision, in everything I do, I want you to be the sole focus of my life. That I want you to, that when you say something, I want to obey. And he took me back. It's so kind of funny to me. He took me back um, to, um, I think it was 1986. It was 1986. And actually, my parents had come to visit me on base. We were having this... Um, this uh, kind of event for the for uh, the community and and uh, well the nation at whole and it was a big ordeal where we were coming in and and uh, the paratroopers were jumping and there were guys you know it was just a demonstration basically of the Canadian special forces and my parents were there and I remember jumping in and 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 coming you know basically you're doing an attack on on the crowd. And then after it was all over, I remember coming in and seeing my mom and my dad. And, and uh, it was one of those kind of neat moments. I, I was a proud son. And I remember my warrant officer, Perry, who was a complete jerk. He really was. But I remember him. You see, when I was in the military, when your um, officer that was above you, when that name got spoke, when your name got spoke, it was that quick. You reacted that quick. It wasn't like I'm going, oh, I'm finishing my conversation. Because I remember I was having a conversation with my parents and I heard Aspen and it was just like this. I was gone. I was, I was gone because I was going to that, to that warrant officer to find out what I needed to do. It was like I was gone so fast that my parents didn't even know I was gone. That's how quick I was gone. Because I reacted that quick. And, he, and th the Lord said, this is what I want from you, son. I want you to act like I am your commanding officer. You used to do it for them. Why won't you do it for me? And I got to tell you, it sucker punched me. That I would do it for a man, but I won't do it for my God. To be that quick. When, you know, and, and hopefully you're on a first name basis with the Lord, right? But, you know, 
when he calls, you're like, you're not, you're not like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's, it's 15 minutes left of, of your favorite program. Right? Or, uh, but I got to go do this. No, do it now. Seek first the kingdom of God. Now, first. You see, many of us, we think we have a choice. We think we have a choice in this gig. And when you look at it from this perspective that I'm trying to put forward, we don't. We don't. In Galatians, Galatians chapter 2. We've been here a hundred times before. I'm sure you've been there a hundred times before. And, and I've only, I only give a, a couple verses, um, verses to the guys, but I want to read from 18 instead. It says, for if I rebuild what I tore down, okay, this is, this is Paul speaking, I prove myself to be a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. And so what he's saying here is that when we've died to the law, the purpose of dying to the law is living for God. In, ver in verse 19, it's for though the law, I died to the law, so I might live to God. And then verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. You see, here's the thing that we have to understand, folks, is that if you've given your life to Christ, that old Ryan is gone. He's dead. And all the things that Ryan used to like to do is dead too. He's dead. The new Ryan is raised up. And he's under orders. He's under orders of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords to do, right? I mean, think of all the things that Jesus told us to do. All the things that, that, that you know, I, I, I hate that I even have to go back, but, but I will. Because somebody out there is thinking, well, you just said the do word and we don't have to do anything for our salvation. Man, will you get that out of your minds? You're already saved, but God is telling you that you need to be doing them some things because you are now a servant of his. You are now a servant of his. You, you are now a, a slave, if you will, taking it all the way back to the, to the, to the story in John chapter 2 of the servants. When Jesus said, go do this, they didn't argue. They just went and did it. Bring it fast forward to 86. When my commanding officer said to go do something, I didn't argue. There was not a question. I just did it. I didn't care who was standing in front of me, whether it was my parents or whether it was the stinking prime minister of Canada. If my CO had called my name, I would have turned my back on him too. This is the obedience that Jesus is looking for. This is the obedience that Jesus is looking for. He's looking for us to give it all to him everything in complete obedience to him to understand that we are dead we are dead jesus now lives through us it's his life he bought it he paid for it it's done if it's done it's done you who are in christ are dead to yourself the old person is dead we're supposed to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. These are, the, these are the, the characteristics of being in Christ Jesus. To being, being dead. But here's, our, here, here's the issue in, in 2 Corinthians 5.15. In 2 Corinthians 5.15. Look at this for a second. It says, and he died, of course, Jesus is he, for all. That those who live might no, long, no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was risen. What's this, what's, what's this telling us? 
I mean, I could you I used to be able to claim that I didn't have any any education, but that's not the case anymore. But I have I have a little education, but it's told told me the same thing when I was a high school dropout. I'm not supposed to be living for me. I'm supposed to be living for him. Well, what's that look like? What's living for him look like? Well, I can tell you, it probably looks like not like 50% of my life. It doesn't look like 50% of my life, probably. If I, I mean, I'm not trying to beat myself up. I'm just trying to be completely honest with you. I've given a lot of my life over to the Lord, but I need to give it the rest of it, and I need to do it now. I needed to do, I needed to do it yesterday. We're not supposed to be living for ourselves. We're supposed to be putting him first. We're supposed to be putting him first in everything. Why would we do such a thing? It's a weird, it's a weird little verse. And I know we have to be careful when we look at verses. But the other day, um, I was going down the road and I was just listening to the Bible. I was just listening to the Bible. I've been in, I've been in John, the gospel of John for about six months now. And I just, I, every time I do my quiet time, I'm in John. Every time I'm, li- I'm on the road listening to the Bible, I'm in John. I just been over and over and over just, just resonating on John, that gospel of John. And in John chapter three and verse 36, it's a very, uh, I just, it jumped off the page to me. I I mean, I know I've read it. I know I've heard it. In the last three months, I've probably heard it or read it at least 100 times, probably more like 200 times. Because, I mean, I've been here forever, it seems like. Look what it says here. In verse 36, it says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Woohoo! right? I believe, man, I believe in Jesus. I got eternal life. But then look what it says in the rest of the verse. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So as I was praying and asking the Lord, what the heck is that all about? This is what I felt like he said. Many of my children have given their life to me, but because they don't obey, they don't experience life and life abundantly. They experience the wrath that I have on this world because they're living in the world. I used to have this little phrase when I first got married and I didn't know Jesus. I used to say it was all about Jill. I did. I used to say that. I used to say that until I got saved, until she got saved. And then she used to, then then I would say it and she'd go, no, it's not all about me. It's all about him. She had to correct me. No, it's not all about me. It's all about Jesus now. It truly is all about Jesus. If you've given your life to Christ, which I'm assuming, you know, I don't like to assume anything, but I'm assuming the entire congregation has given their life to Christ. If you you have, it's all about him. Our whole life is about him. Our whole life is about glorifying him. Our whole life is about doing and being in him. What's it look like? Well, we're supposed to minister to him. We're supposed to be ministers. We're supposed to make offerings to him, sacrifice offerings to him. Whether it be our tithe or whether it be our time. Whether it be our, uh, um, you know, sharing Jesus Christ with somebody or being that living sacrifice of every decision we make goes through him. That we take every thought captive to the obedience of him. We seek first him in everything. I'm everything. We seek first him. We make and keep him first in our first love. Let me say that again. Make and keep him your first love. We understand and live out of the fact 
The old person is dead. So live as a new person. I, I don't have enough time to, to, um, to, to keep going in this. I'll pick it up next week. But this, the mindset, the, the mindset of this pushes into freedom and victory. And so, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm making, a, I'm making a, a, a ploy for next week. You need to come next week. Because, because no, seriously, because what, what, as, it, as it unloads, you're going to see what God is doing through this thing called obedience. What he's doing, you know, yes, we, we have given our lives to Jesus Christ through faith, by grace, right? And, and that's the only way that we can be saved or we're going we're gonna to say, well, we're going to claim some type of, of, well, I'm better than you or, or I'm better than you because Jesus saved me. No, it, we are all saved by faith in Jesus Christ, amen? But here's the thing, it, through obedience, we have life and we have life abundantly. And that's many why we're, we're experiencing some of the still dysfunctions in our lives. And we know this, we know it. But somehow we think we have a choice in the matter. But really we don't because Christ owns you. He owns you. You are his. There is no, hear me now. I know it's a hard message, but there is no you. There is only him in you. Do whatever he tells you. Do it first. Well, how do you do that? When we went to that conference, Steve, in um, November, one of the things, the profound things that um, I think it was, uh, shoot, I can't remember his name now. Um, oh, man, the very first speaker that we heard that night uh, is the African-American fellow, Joseph Garlington. What an awesome speaker. Right. What an awesome speaker. But what he said is he said this and it was so profound. I wrote it down. I circled it and I starred it. And and it's been way there. It, you know, when people say stuff and the Lord utilizes it in your life, it, it has weight in your life. And, and ever since he spoke it, it's had weight in my life. And I'm sure Steve knows what I'm going to say. But I believe if we begin to get our head above or excuse me, our heart above our head. We'll find Jesus. How do we do that? How do you get, how do you get your, your head below your heart? Or your heart above your head? How do you do that? How do you do it? It's only one way I know. In complete worship. It's the only way I know. Complete worship. Complete worship to put him where he needs to be and us where we need to be. My challenge to you this week is to put him first. Tonight, when you get in your car, please don't throw your Bible in your back seat. Keep it right with you. Put him first. Say, as for me and my house, we're going to follow the Lord. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to put him first. I'm going to make a challenge to you. I can't do it like Pastor Lee did it, you know, with the whole tithing thing. Remember us challenging you that, that if, um, if you tithe for whatever period it was, was I can't even remember now, and and um, it wasn't productive in your life that we would write the check back to you. Remember that? And as far as I know, we never wrote any checks. So obviously, God worked in 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 that little challenge pretty mightily. Well, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you. You put God first in everything you do for the next ninety days, and try to prove me wrong, that you will experience God like you've never experienced him in your Christian walk thus far. Put him 
first. Put him first. And so, Lord, tonight, we pray for empowerment to do that very thing, Lord. We pray to choose you and choose you and choose you and choose you and then choose you again, Lord. We pray, Father God, that we will get to the point where our rationalization of our behavior and our actions will be overcome by the love that we've already received from you, Lord. And that overcoming love, that, that, that love that you've given each one of us, Father God, will infiltrate us in such a way that we will want to choose you in everything we do. That we will want to choose you and honor you in everything we do, Lord. To be completely obedient to the words that you've given us in this book called the Holy Bible. And in the words that you've given us in re personal revelation through our journals and prayer times. That we would truly, truly, truly honor you with our lives, Lord. And in honoring you with our lives, experience that abundant life you talk about in John 10.10. 10. And so walk with us now as we leave this place. Give us a continual sense of your presence in our lives, Lord. Lord, tonight we pray for after the service, Lord. We pray for empowerment to answer the call that, that uh, any may have in, in need of prayer, Lord. We just pray for empowerment, a baptism of your Holy Spirit to fall on this place. That baptism to walk out in obedience to what you want us to do, Lord. For your glory and yours alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.